This lecture will provide an introduction to campaign finance. Uh, we'll have a series of lectures on, on campaign finance, and, and this is really an attempt just to set the stage here. And so the, the, the various lectures on campaign finance, this first one is going to be an introduction to the critical concepts and sort of the nature of the campaign finance system. The second one will uh, talk about Buckley versus Vallejo and the important issues of corruption and the, distinguishing, the, the distinction between contributions and expenditures. The third campaign finance lecture will talk about political parties, interest groups, and issue advocacy. And the fourth will talk about corporations, unions, and campaign finance with particular attention to the court's decision in Citizens United versus FEC. Reducing the costs of campaigns by campaign finance. And there could be all kinds of other uh, interests that might be furthered by restrictions on campaign finance activity. But what I wanna emphasize at the start is that the Supreme Court now has said that it's only the prevention of corruption or the appearance of corruption which are the legitimate state interests when it comes to regulating campaign finance activity. So second, let's talk about how we regulate campaign finance. What is sort of the universe of campaign finance restrictions? So these lectures are not going to do deep dives into the particular limits that are in federal law. Um, uh, that really, all, that could take many, many lectures uh, and start to resemble tax law at a certain point. Um, but, but here are the different ways that we regulate campaign finance. And the ones that are uh, underlined on the screen are the ones that are constitutionally probably okay. Um, so the first is contribution restrictions, restricting the amount of money that a person, a contributor, can give to a candidate or a political party. That's distinct from a spending restriction, which would say, how much could a candidate or outside uh, group or individual spend on a campaign? So the distinction between contributing, giving money to a candidate, and spending independently is absolutely critical to campaign finance. Third, you could have uh, public financing, the cutting of checks by um, the government to parties or candidates. Now, the court has struck down several uh, public financing schemes, but as a general rule, the mere giving of money uh, to candidates is not constitutionally problematic. Fourth is disclosure. Uh, as a general rule, disclosure has been upheld by the Supreme Court even in uh, Citizens United versus FEC. So trying to force people to disclose where the monies are, where money is coming from um, and uh, who is financing campaigns, that is constitutionally permissible. And then fifth and related to these previous uh, restrictions are what we call source restrictions so that you might have certain uh, requirements for particular types of entities like corporations or unions or political parties could be treated differently or, or the many different kinds of interest groups such as PACs which are political action committees, super PACs which are independent expenditure committees or other groups that are designated by parts of the, um, the tax code like 501c4 social welfare organizations, 501c3 charities or 527 uh, political advocacy organizations. So different groups might have different um, requirements that are applied to them. Some of them, like PACs, are a creature of the campaign finance laws, and some of them are, uh, as indicated by the numbers, uh, referred to by provisions in the tax code. You might have restrictions on out-of-state residents participating in campaigns, but that actually has been declared unconstitutional. Um, you can prohibit non-citizens um, from engaging in uh, campaigns. And so there's, there's federal law that, that is uh, relevant to that. But that, again, is another source restriction, as is uh, restricting children from uh, giving money or uh, spending money in campaigns. That also actually came up in, in uh, some campaign finance cases where it struck down and said that uh, kids, so long as they're actually using their own money, have a constitutional right uh, to finance campaigns, even though they can't vote. I want to emphasize at the outset, though, how exceptional the United States is when it comes to campaign finance. The U.S. system of campaign finance is the most libertarian in the world, meaning that we have fewer restrictions than almost any other country. Um, but that's also because we, we spend more on campaigns than any other country. Uh, and our party system and our candidate-focused campaigns are quite different than most parts of the world. Uh, we don't have. We have some public funding for local races, and there is there are provisions in federal law that are now not used all that often that provide for public funding. Uh, but we also have regular elections, you know, for Congress and for and for the presidency. Whereas in other 
uh, parts of the world, uh, the, the elections are not always occurring according to a set calendar. It might happen as a result of a vote of no confidence in parliament or a prime minister calls for an election. And so that necessarily will contract the amount of time that um, will be spent in an election campaign. But, but because of the nature of the American political system, our, our elections are so much more expensive than almost any other country in the world, and our campaign finance system um, is uh, adapted to deal with that, those expensive uh, attributes of our system. So now let's, let's talk a little bit about the challenges in regulating campaign finance activity. One argument that comes up in many of these cases is what's often known as the hydraulic argument, that money always finds a way into the system. Like water on a sidewalk, it always finds a crack. So that, you know, if you, if you limit the amount of money that individuals can give to candidates, well, then maybe they'll give it to political parties. If you limit the amount of money they can give to political parties, maybe they give it to PACs, political action committees or other kinds of interest groups. You limit the amount of money they can give to them, maybe they give to super PACs, which are sort of independent organizations that um, will uh, sort of spend uh, beyond limits. If you prevent even that from money going into those systems, maybe people will just spend it on their own. And so uh, the money is fi finds a way into the system uh, regardless of how the, the, what the, the requirements are. Um, and so part of what campaign finance law does is that it, it sort of shifts money from one um, direction to another. Now, I don't want to suggest that that it's it's kind of fatalist that that there, that campaign finance laws don't have uh, impacts. They do, but but depending on the constitutional rules, um, money will move to its sort of highest and best use, and and sort of political entrepreneurs will uh, try to get money from eager contributors uh, if they are still willing to do so. Second issue when it comes to the challenges in regulating campaign finance has to do with the difficulty of defining and targeted corruption or undue influence. We'll spend a lot of time in the next lecture talking about the issue of corruption, but um, you know the idea of corruption is a very malleable concept and it is absolutely critical in understanding campaign finance law. Um, but how you sort of organize the campaign finance system to try to target corruption proves to be very difficult. Third, uh, and initial I'll, I'll deal with a little bit more later in this lecture, is that campaign regulations have different effects on different types of candidates. Uh, and so if you're a candidate with, with a lot of name recognition or if you're an incumbent, um, you may not need to raise as much money as a poor candidate that's trying to get his or her name out. And it is quite difficult to predict how much, much, how much money is necessary to run an effective campaign and the impact of campaign finance restrictions on the raising of money. So that what, for example, contribution limits do is they simply say that you have to raise uh, sort of more money from, uh, or, or less money from more contributors. That you have to get, uh, you know, if you have a, a $200 campaign contribution limit, that means that if you have, if it takes $10,000 to run an effective campaign, you're going to end up having to, uh, you know, gather up at least 500 checks of $2,000. Um, and so it, it's very hard to figure out exactly when um, those restrictions are so burdensome that it makes it difficult to run an effective campaign. So in the background of a lot of the constitutional discussion surrounding campaign finance is this larger issue of whether money is speech or property. So if you look at the writings of, of Justice John Paul Stevens, for example, uh, his uh, opinion, his separate opinion in Nixon versus Shrink Missouri Government PAC takes this on explicitly, where he says, look, money's property, it's not speech. Speech has the power to inspire volunteers to perform a multitude of tasks on a campaign trail, on the battleground, or even on a football field. Meanwhile, money has the power to pay hired laborers to perform the same tasks. It doesn't follow, however, that the First Amendment provides the same measure of protection to the use of money to accomplish such goals as it provides to the use of ideas to achieve the same results. And the right to use one's own money to hire gladiators and to fund speech by proxy are property rights, not entitled to the same protection as the right to say what one pleases. Justice Byron White in FEC versus Nick Pack says a similar uh, thing where he says that the First Amendment protects the right to speak, not the right to spend, and limitations on the amount of money that can be spent are not the same as restrictions on speaking. Expenditures produce such speech. They're not speech itself. Such a house that Jack built approach could equally be used to find a First Amendment right to a job or to a minimum wage to produce the money to produce the speech. So that's one view 
which frankly has been discredited by the case law. And so that is not what the law is. Um, instead, the Supreme Court has been quite protective of the notion that money is speech. Now, this quote from Justice Antonin Scalia is from a dissent in McConnell versus FEC, but it's pretty much um, the way that the court has thought about um, the relationship of campaign finance to the First Amendment. Effective public communication, he says, requires a speaker to make use of the services of others. An author may write a novel, but he'll seldom publish and distribute it himself. A freelance reporter may write a story, but he'll rarely edit, print, or deliver it to subscribers. To a government bent on suppressing speech, this mode of organization prevents, presents opportunities. Um, um, control any cog in the machine, and you can halt the whole apparatus. License printers, and it matters little whether authors are still free to write. Restrict the sale of books, and it matters little who prints them. Predictably, repressive regimes have exploited these principles by attacking all levels of production and dissemination of ideas. As Justice Scalia further explains in McConnell versus FEC, his dissent, it should be obvious then that a law limiting the amount a person can spend to broadcast his political views is a direct restriction on speech. That is no different from a law limiting the amount a newspaper can pay its editorial staff or the amount a charity can pay its leafleters. It is equally clear that a limit on the amount a candidate can, can raise from any one individual for the purpose of speaking is also a direct limitation on speech. That is no different from a law limiting the amount a publisher can accept from any one shareholder or lender or the amount a newspaper can charge any one advertiser or customer. And so uh, th this notion that spending uh, and controls on spending affect speech uh, is something that started in Buckley versus Vallejo, continues through to Citizens United uh, and its progeny. One analogy that comes up in these cases is whether money for campaigns is like gas for a car. As the court explained in Buckley versus Vallejo, being free to engage in unlimited political expression subject to a ceiling on expenditures is like being free to drive an automobile as far and as often as one desires on a single tank of gasoline. So the idea here is that if you don't have enough money to spend on your campaign, it's like having a car that doesn't have enough gas in it. Here's the way Justice Stevens responds to that uh, analogy in a later case in his dissent in uh, Randall versus Sorrell, dealing with uh, contribution limits in Vermont. He says, but of course, while a car can't run without fuel, a candidate can speak without spending money. And while a car can only travel so many miles per gallon, there's no limit on the number of speeches or interviews a candidate may give on a limited budget. Moreover, provided this budget is above a certain threshold, a candidate can exercise due care to ensure that her message reaches all voters. Just as a driver need not use a Hummer to reach her destination, so a candidate need not flood the airways with ceaseless sound bites of trivial information in order to provide voters with reasons to support her. And so for Justice Stevens, uh, it, there's a, quite a bit of difference between uh, gas for a car and uh, money for campaigns. Um, that uh, whether you go back to the Lincoln-Douglas debates or uh, Welling Jennings Bry Bryan's uh, Cross of Gold speech, both examples that he mentions uh, in that dissent, um, that for, uh, for speakers who are campaigning, um, it's not the case that it always requires that you have money in order uh, to reach an audience. Now, that might be true, um, but it's certainly the case that some speech, some campaign speech can be very expensive. And, and as in most areas of life, you know, if you have more uh, money, you'll be able to uh, more effectively compete uh, in political campaigns. Another issue that comes up in these campaign finance uh, cases that I want to introduce at the outset is whether money is different than other types of influence. And so in order to think about whether money has undue influence over, say, an officeholder's judgment, you have to have a theory about what kind of influences do. Why is it that money is seen as particularly problematic as opposed to responding to your constituents, responding to your conscience, to pressures of political party, your friends, family, or colleagues, or interest groups, experts, the media, lobbyists, right? There are all kinds of influences on a uh, legislator. And part of the challenge in these campaign finance cases is to figure out why uh, money is a kind of impermissible kind of influence. I think we generally uh, all ag agree on that, um, but that it, you know, so that we have, for example, bribery laws that prevent money from uh, buying political influence. But the theory undergirding campaign finance regulation and the court's upholding of it is that money poses a particular, particular danger when it comes to the influence of politicians. Next, 
One of the issues that, that comes up repeatedly in these cases is the problem of incumbency. Um, and that, is, that goes back to the point I was making before that uh, different candidates are going to have uh, be affected in different ways by campaign finance restrictions. But also there's, there's a question here, as in many other areas in the law of democracy, as to whether campaign finance regulations are um, particularly uh, should should be treated with particular suspicion uh, because they're passed by incumbents and wouldn't incumbents pass laws that are most likely to reinforce their ability uh, to win office. And so uh, just as is true in the voter ID area or redistricting or some other areas where there, we have suspicion about the laws that incumbents are passing, there, there are some situations in which the court has been suspicious of um, uh, incumbent motives in passing campaign finance legislation. But second, as I was saying before, the uh, campaign money has a different value for incumbents than it does for challengers or, or people in open running in open seats. And this is really quite important. Uh, incumbents usually enjoy name recognition and access to media that only money can buy for challengers. Challenger spending, uh, uh, you know, you, you challenger often needs to spend a lot more money to get that name recognition and to run a competitive campaign. And one of the interesting features is that, you know, as challengers spend money, it's often the case that their vote share increases. But as incumbents spend money, perversely, it seems like their vote share decreases. But that's because the incumbents who need to spend a lot of money are often the most vulnerable incumbents. So different candidates uh, value political money differently. Uh, so that if you're a, a challenger without a lot of money, uh, then you need to raise a lot of money from contributors in order to get your name out there and, and to try to launch an effective campaign against an incumbent. And so the amount of money that a candidate needs really does depend on whether they're an incumbent, whether they're a challenger, whether they're running in an open seat. Here's the way Justice Scalia describes the incumbency problem in his dissent in McConnell versus FEC and why we should be suspicious of uh, laws that are passed by incumbents that regulate campaign finance. That was the case dealing with the famous um, McCain-Feingold law, part of which was overturned in Citizens United versus FEC. But this was dealing, his quote deals with the, um, the restrictions on so-called soft money, uh, regulations on contributions to political parties. The way he says, he says, to be sure the legislation is even handed. It similarly prohibits criticism of the candidates who oppose members of Congress in the reelection bids. But as everyone knows, this is an area in which even handedness is not fairness. If all electioneering were even handily prohibited, incumbents would have an enormous advantage. Likewise, if incumbents and challenges are limited to the same quantity of electioneering, incumbents are favored. In other words, any restriction upon a type of campaign speech that is equally available to challengers and incumbents tends to favor incumbents. Final sort of introductory concept when it comes to campaign finance uh, revolves around the special role of the media. Because it's not as if the campaign playing field is neutral, but for political money. Uh, so that campaign spending uh, really is trying to uh, rectify the imbalance in the uh, media environment as to which candidates are being uh, covered. And so uh, if no candidates were allowed to engage in advertising or to get their message out, well, then voters would be relying on the mass media in order to get information relevant to the election. And so part of the challenge here is how do we how should we limit expenditures related to campaigns without accounting for the uh, amount that the media spends in covering campaigns? Now, clearly, it would be unconstitutional to say, for example, that The New York Times or or Fox News is not allowed to spend a certain amount of money communicating messages relevant to a campaign. That would be core First Amendment activity. But why is it that we can that, that the media gets a free pass here, but other institutions that are trying to counteract the media's message or to or rectify the imbalance in media coverage, that we can, consistent with the First Amendment, uh, regulate the amount of money that they can uh, contribute or, or potentially regulate the amount of money that they can spend. So there, there are many different sort of allegations about how the media uh, coverage of, of campaigns uh, is is biased or or somehow not neutral. Um, what some think the media is too liberal. You look at the fact that most reporters are Democrats, and and conservatives will point to that and say, look, we need to be able to counteract that message with effective electioneering and campaign activity. Some think the media is too conservative because the corporate interests of the media uh, might lead to slanted news coverage, particularly as it relates to the corporate interests of of news organizations.
And then there are others who say, the media sort of analysts who say that, no, the media favors conflict, that the types of things that the media, mass media and journalists will cover are different than the kinds of things that, you know, the average politician or candidate would like to uh, get out as their message. The law has recognized the special role for the media so that even when uh, bans on corporate campaign spending were upheld uh, prior to Citizens United, there's always been in the law a special exception for the media so that we can't say that, you know, news organizations can only spend a million dollars covering presidential campaigns. But especially in the age of the internet, it's really difficult to define who is the media these days when anybody can blog or post a YouTube video or tweet. And so the special treatment that the media has has received under campaign finance law uh, seems out of place uh, as the notion of the media expands to pretty much anybody who has a cell phone uh, in their pocket who can produce something that will appear on the internet. So keep these lessons in mind as we go through the different cases uh, related to campaign finance. Um, these questions of, of the power of the media, the power of incumbency, how we think about the different forms of regulation uh, will come up throughout the many cases uh, that we cover in this section of the course.